So uh, welcome students and panelists to another in our series of panel discussions at the Science Circle. Today our topic is the internet. With allegations of hacking, disinformation, troll farms and the like being implicated in Brexit and the Mueller investigation of Trump and Russia, I think everyone is recently more alarmed at the potential for evil global internet. So let's take a hard look at it. We have a great panel of experts to enlighten us. Um, Dark Eagle Darkstone, uh, I believe sitting uh, here in the middle. Um, uh, Myron Curtis uh, has taught cybersecurity at Butte College in Northern California, served on the California Cybersecurity Task Force to make recommendations to the governor's office has uh, managed and repaired computer networks, certified in a number of uh, programming languages, um, and uh, um, Dark Eagle is uh, interested in cyber hygiene, since we are all connected to the same internet. Um, so if one person has a compromised system, we are at uh, greater risk. We. Uh, also have uh, R. Sam G., who goes by Sam. Uh, he teaches uh, computer science and cybersecurity at St. Mary's University and has performed cybersecurity assessments uh, and application uh, testing for the Center for uh, Medicare Services. Um, and uh, also has a, um, a background in sort of uh, industrial or corporate cybersecurity. Um, and finally, we have uh, um, Bill Youngblood, who is a, a Vic over there, uh, furthest from me. Um, uh, and uh, Vic is just an all-around um, smart person who knows a lot of things, and he's going to um, kind of help us keep things real, um, and maybe kind of be our color commentator to use um, to help us kind of uh, digest. Uh, with that introduction, I would like to, um, oops, uh, did I lose um, Dark Eagle? Ooh, did someone crash? Um, let's see. Okay, well, um, thank you. Um, uh, oh, here he is, he's come back. So that was pretty quick. Bear with us, technical problems. Oh, thank you very much for letting me know. Um, is this better? I think my microphone might have been too far from my mouth. Okay. Um, all right. So um, just to kind of uh, restart a little bit, um, our panelists are uh, Dark Eagle Darkstone, um, Sam, and Vic. Um, uh, each of which has uh, brings a unique perspective on the uh, issue of the internet and cybersecurity. Um, if Dark Eagle is ready, I would like to uh, let him make the opening um, uh, panel remarks. So let's hope that that's going to work. It should. Success. Can you? Yeah, you can hear me. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, so the reality of today is that we are all connected to the same internet. It doesn't matter if you're a school, doesn't matter if you're a governor. Oops, we lost voice, I think. 
Did you lose my voice? There, now it's back. Okay. So to quickly recap is that with all the matter going on and the hacks, um, the question is becoming more and more important who's actually liable for any losses that are occurred. You know, it's um, it's entirely possible that someone might actually get sued because somebody using the computer system, even a friend, or even on their own uh, network with the phone, manages test, to test, do test, test. test. I'm picking up crud. Okay. Um, Just continue, um, uh, Myron. That's okay. fine. Okay. So anyway, it's entirely possible that you could get sued if something to do with your computer system has contributed in some way to causing somebody else a loss of some kind. It could be financial. It could be emotional. You know, and it could also be you know, the case of businesses. If they lose a lot of money and um, the attack occurred from a coffee shop somewhere, the coffee shop chain, chain could also be held liable because they did not practice due diligence. So the California Cybersecurity Task Force, trying to find a way to... Um, make people aware of this without actually threatening them, came up with a term called cyber hygiene. You know, and just as you would never want somebody to make you a salad if they had never washed their hands, why would you want somebody hooked up to your network who's never run a virus scan? So it's still in the works, and they're um, introducing it through the community colleges first. But it is something that's going to go uh, nationwide, possibly worldwide, that we start teaching people what the basic elements of security are so they can uh, be practicing some due diligence. You know, for example, they really need to have some kind of antivirus. They really should stay away from certain parts of the Internet and the dark web just as we should probably stay away from dark alleys in big cities. You know, um, there's also the possibility that uh, they need to have a good firewall. They need to understand how to configure their their routers, or at least there needs to be a presetting on the routers that's kind of like a, a secure profile. And the pe people who are more advanced, for example, people hosting virtual worlds and have to have a lot of ports open on their routers can uh, create a, a custom profile perhaps but um, it's really becoming a, a very important question you know how much liability an individual shares with the, uh, the amount of malware and hacks that are going on this hmm um so yeah, that's pretty interesting. How, um, how? Uh, well, actually, before I uh, sort of get into my questions, what, let me continue with our uh, panel commentary, and then I'll have a chance to uh, to chime okay, in. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, uh, Sam, would you like to uh, make some opening remarks? Uh, yeah, um, I kind I totally agree with that. Uh, one thing I found, uh, what I, I consider uh, user awareness, uh, get that kind of training to everybody is important, so they understand the risks out there, and uh, how to protect themselves from it, and what not to do out there. I think that's the most important things. I consider the uh, internet the wild west. There's uh, so many actors out there trying to collect data on you in with fake news that it's uh, kind of important to uh, get the people up to speed and understand the internet and what uh, what's good and what's bad and, and where can be where's uh, dangerous stuff. Yes, that completely makes sense. 
Um, and uh, Vic, um, what's uh, what's your perspective? Sure. Okay. First, real quick question: Is this just a, a introduction, or would it be a good time for me to talk about the note card? Um, you are welcome to get into the note uh, note card. I think uh, I'm I'm ready to kind of get into the weeds here. So let's go for it. Okay. Uh, to my left, my avatar's left, <laughs> you'll see kind of a little spiral thing uh, that's taller than the chair. If you click on it, there's a note card that I'm essentially going to be talking about that. Uh, Background-wise, um, I don't have the credentials in this particular field. I do in computer technology in general, but I did start our cybersecurity program at a university, so I'm versed in what kinds of things go into it, as well as taught a course in personal security. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned liability. Uh, let me bring that up in a second. But most, most of us have uh, spaces that we think of as home or office or a vehicle where we kind of go to feel safe and comfortable and so we can let our guard down against uh, potential hazards that we face on the outside. And, the steps we take to secure those spaces depends on, one, our view of the worth of what we have, uh, or ourselves, our view of other people, and how we understand our environment. So let's take one side. Let's pretend you're a college student in a dormitory, um, a worker in a cubicle, or a resident in a small town. You may feel that uh, maybe you don't have enough, or, or I mean, excuse me, that you may not have anything somebody wants, or that the people around you are mostly honest, uh, that your surroundings are safe enough. Uh, I've been to small towns where they leave their doors open, or their doors unlocked. Um, same thing with your cubicle if you're working there, or an office. Uh, you may feel safe enough to talk openly about your self and your life and to walk and act fairly carefree without looking around you. So now let's take the other side is that uh, pretend that you have either an inflated view of your own worth. We were talking about politicians earlier or the worth of your things or you really do have valuable things that are easily taken and not easily replaced. And maybe you believe that everyone out there is would harm you or take advantage of you given the chance or that you're all just waiting out to jump you the moment you let your guard down. And, and so in this case, you might lock your doors, you might have deadbolts, you might install a security system, put blinds on your window, buy a dog that barks or growls, buy a gun that you keep close with you. So which of these scenarios describe cyberspace? Um, well, both and neither. So how is that? Let's take a look at some realities. Is uh, so far, I've just been talking about physical security because that's what we are familiar with. And even in a perfect world, you still need some sort of physical security. I mean, besides the social norms is you wear clothes to keep yourself warm. You wear shoes to, so you don't hurt your feet. And you also think about safeguarding. You should also think about safeguarding your smartphone and your laptop in the same way. I mean, if it drops, it's the same as if somebody took it, if it uh, breaks and doesn't work. Uh, or temperatures extreme, leaving it in a car is, uh, would be the same result. Um, except people wouldn't have the data, but you'd lose it yourself. And so you take care of the same thing with you is you take care of your physical and mental health, that you work properly. And since the data on your smartphone or laptops uh, more valuable probably to you than the device itself, I'd recommend that you copy the important information to another device. and. Uh, store it in a safe place other than on your device. In other words, if the device gets stolen, well, then your backups get stolen too. Although I do both myself. Um, now that place can be physical, like a, a storage device someplace that you have in another area, or it can be virtual, like an online service you trust. So now let's, uh, that we've talked about physical security, let's talk about a data security. Let's talk about cyberspace. Because that's something that we don't, aren't as familiar with. So whether you're lying in bed texting a friend on your smartphone or you're at your laptop online at work, uh, it's very easy to think of yourself because of the physical surroundings. It's just you and your computer, but that's not really the reality. The moment you go online, because of the nature of the internet, 
Um, because of the nature of the internet, it's as if you just walked outside a hotel on a busy street or you stepped out of your car into a, into a shopping mall, is that there are places that are familiar to you, um, but you cannot know who's around you or what they want. And that doesn't mean you have to be paranoid, uh, just aware of what, what we used to call street smart about your surroundings. It's the same thing as if you were a tourist and you're traveling in Rome or in other parts of the world. So let's look at some examples of what I mean. Well, the first thing is that people divulge a lot of information about themselves on social media because it seems like, well, well, that's a safe place and I've got just my friends and I'm just, it's just me and my computer and their computers. But every social media site, every website, every search engine is a business. Well, what do businesses want? They want to know about their customers. So they'd love to know as much about you as possible so they can target you for things and services to buy. And the more you know about you, the closer they can get to discovering what they want. Uh, well, probably here also. <laughs> so it makes good business sense for them to ask you as much information as, they can, as you'll give them. So they ask you for your name. Okay, you think, well, that sounds reasonable since a lot of people know your name. Um, yeah, but what about, do you really need to give them your real name? You know, in Second Life, we used to, except for the people that are actually presenting, most people go around as avatars. Does a, does a business really need to know your full name? That's often why I just use Phil, because then I know whether people are selling my data, if they come up with Phil or Philip or middle name or other things like that. Um, what about, what if they ask for your middle name? As I mentioned, do you have to give them that? Now, what about your address? Well, okay, I guess they need that for billing or something. Of course, this is all what you say to yourself. But really, could you give them a post office box? Like, I often have a post office box because that's where I send stuff rather than a real address, perhaps, or a business address instead. What about your birth date? Why? What do they really need it for? And do you have to give them your birth date? Uh, is it just so that they can make sure that the decisions you make are legal? In other words, if you buy something, if you contract something, well, fine. But do they really need the correct day, month, year? I mean, everybody? Oh, yeah. It's, it, it's online because of two things. One, you've given it to people. But the other thing is because sometimes people divulge it to other people, even legitimate places, or they, uh, that sort of thing. But th why should you have to do that in Facebook? Why should you have to do that in everybody, give them your all your information that's correct. So what about a personally identifying number, like a social security number? I had a student the other day that filled out a form and it said social security number. Well, we haven't actually, it was a very, very old form from the 90s and we haven't asked for social security numbers a long time, but there they had social security number, just like, you know, whatever. Um, what does a business or, or a person really need to know with that number? I mean, there are some, that need to know that, but you need to be smart enough to know who needs to know a number like that, which represents you. Okay, so now think about it. Think about, in other words, um, every little piece of information, you've, you've watched movies and stuff, every little piece of information that you give out online is one step closer to someone guessing the rest, like what we were talking about uh, jokingly earlier about uh, what kind of security questions you might have, but what do you really need to know to take money out of your bank or use your credit card or assume your identity or to use your computer without you knowing. So I'm not saying that there's no, not any perfectly good reason for some businesses to know this information. There are some that do, but would you tell that information to a stranger because just because they walked up and asked you? No. So why would you click, click on a link on an email from a stranger no matter what the message said, no matter what the message said? Uh, maybe the message looks like it's coming from a friend, but if it sounds suspicious, it only takes a minute to contact your friend and see if they actually sent it. Would you stand in the middle of the store and shout that information out? Well, probably not. And yet there are many people who are willing to give that information out to any business, any person who asks it online. Where do you work? Uh, sure. Where did you go to school? Why not? Where are you right now? Which also means, by the way, that you're not home. For anyone that knows, absolutely, your favorite color. What do you like to watch? What did you do last night? Who are your friends? 
uh, if I want to find out somebody like my students, I can go to I can go to any website and I can find out way more about them than they would be willing to tell me under torture. Uh, and so can employers, by the way, and that's one of the things they do. So now let's go back to you and your computer. Being online is a bit like sitting at an airport with people all around you. It's not just you comfortably in bed with your phone. Uh, you may be perfectly safe. I mean, after all, most people, I go by the thing that most people are honest. Most people are just out there to uh, do what they're doing. And frankly, they don't care. They've got their own business going on. They don't care if you're there. You're not really that important, seriously. But if, if you're talking to your friend sitting next to you or online a world away and you give out some important information about you or what you're doing, or most people won't pay attention. They'll forget. But if you drop your wallet or you leave your purse or your phone sitting there, most people will point it out to you and help, but not everybody. There are a handful of people who are not so honest or respectful of you or your things. So security... Really, you have to take it important because of the small number of bad actors out there. And also because, like we were saying about liability, is this is the one place. This is the one place. You may not be able to contribute to the next discoveries on Mars or recombinant DNA, as we were talking about. But you do hold the keys to the safety of yourself, to your friends, to other people online, all of that. Uh, and that's very interesting. So you have just as much power in many cases as, as those people and just as much responsibility. And that is cyberspace. That's cybersecurity. Now, I'm not saying that cyberspace is a paranoid world where you should never leave your room or vehicle, but it is a crowded city where you should safeguard your values, be aware of your surroundings, who might be around you at all times. That's just common sense. But common sense is not so common. And it's very easy to uh, del delude yourself that it's just you and your computer. So most people are honest, even if they're not all nice and only, and only a handful of people are dangerous. But it's for those type of people that you want to make it as difficult as possible for them to get the information from you. So like burglars, what's a burglar going to do? A, a, a common burglar will just uh, try open doors and windows and uh, they'll move on to the next house if they don't find one. And don't know what your valuables you have inside. But if you already told them and they're determined, it's going to be hard for you to protect them anyway. So you should copy them or safeguard them in some way. But the same thing applies online. So in, in conclusion for my remarks here, and I'm going to hand it over to the other others, is there's an old joke that I first heard in Africa in 1994 when I was in Somalia. And it goes like this. It's the one about the group of friends discussing if they could outrun a lion. Well, one of them turns to the other and says, I don't have to outrun the line. I just have to outrun you. And that's reality. And that's just a part of living safely in the world and uh, cyberspace. But I'd add one more thing, though. It's not an everyone out for themselves competition like the so-called friends trying to outrun the lion. Yeah, that's the other one. It's the bear in the woods sort of thing. But it's, a, it's an old joke. It's just that in, uh, when I was in Africa, they were talking about lions. Uh, because that was more real. So if the lion wants, it can... Now remember, this is not an everyone out for themselves. If the lion wants, it can get everyone individually. So cyber security is more like all of us turning to face the lion together. Every one of us has to be aware, know how to secure ourselves, and by doing so, we can all work together to make cyberspace, cyberspace a safer place for all of us. And that's kind of my remarks, and I'd love to hear from the experts. Um, thank you. Uh, that was a fantastic overview, Vic. Um, uh, Dark Eagle, um, what is your reaction to that? I'm in complete agreement with Vic. Um, it's really... Uh, difficult these days to preserve your privacy. I tend to joke around and say that you really don't have any any way and probably haven't had for a long time. But uh, just as he mentioned with social, uh, social media, there are a lot of uh, games and uh, a lot of postings out there where they they want to ask questions about you. And if you think about the answers they're asking for, 
those are the same answers that you would give, say, as your security questions to your bank or some other financial institution. So you really do have to be a little bit paranoid. Granted, you know, security professionals are supposed to be paranoid for everybody, but that's only in certain situations. Everybody needs to basically wash their hands before they get on the net. You know, practice good cyber hygiene. Know, um, know where you're going on the Internet. Uh, careful what pages you open up. You know, a lot of the browsers now have a nice little color uh, change at the top of the browser if it's a secure site or if it's a insecure site. Pay attention to that. Um, there's still a lot of the websites that have the little paddle lock icon that show that it's supposed to be a secure site. But also be aware that uh, just about anybody can put one of those up there. So it may still be a phishing uh, website where they're trying to look like, say, your bank's web page. They usually do a poor job of that, but uh, you know, you do have to take the time to uh, consider where you're going. Um, my common practice, if I get a link in an email saying, say, that my PayPal has been compromised, I don't open that link out of the email. I go to the web and go directly to my PayPal account to see what's going on, and usually it's a scam. In fact, I think there was only one time that uh, it was actually something from PayPal. So be careful of that, and also be practical. Know very well that there's no oil minister in Nigeria or anywhere else or their widow who's going to put a million dollars in your account and let you keep the interest. Ain't going to happen. You know, so don't even click on that. I actually did a, a trace on one of those emails, which you can do. It's difficult, but uh, it's doable. And I actually traced it back to Belgade, Belgraden, Ireland, where some of the uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists were being held at the time. So it makes you wonder if that's one of the ways they were trying to raise funds. Wow. I actually that's, that's sent an email to them. Go ahead. No, just saying that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, and there's a lot of things like that are that are going on, you know. But really, it it's a matter of practicality. It's a matter of you know being aware, like Vic said, where you are and what you're doing. Um, and uh, you know, I, I tell my students this, or used to that if you're going to go someplace dangerous be protected there are people out there who would gladly burn your systems to the ground if you let them if you're dumb enough not to have your shields up when you go so the reality is you just stay out of sites that are dangerous but sometimes if you uh, have to go there at least make sure you're you know ready to accept the consequences well, so um, how, what, I kind of want to talk a little bit about viruses. It seems to me that um, in the early days of the internet, viruses were, were, were the thing that everyone was freaked out about. I kind of feel like nowadays you hear less about viruses, but you do hear more about sort of, uh, you know, um, malicious programs in email attachments, I mean, that's how the John Podesta emails were hacked. Russia mm -hmm. was an, an email that had a malicious program in, um, that could access all of the emails. Now, is that considered a virus or or is that um, – and also these kind of like weird sort of, e sort of solicitations by Nigerian princes are – this all seems kind of uh, – this sort of – Getting gaining entry by email seems actually kind of low tech to me. Um, are there um, malicious program tools that don't require that, that are like really malicious, that can just somehow get into the network, can be loaded into the network by the originator um, without someone clicking on something? Um, Sam, could you speak to that? Do you mind? Um, what kind of what kind of technically? 
what kind of threats are out there that what kind of tools are out there that malicious people use okay yeah i'd be glad to again you mentioned much about the email again uh, if you go back uh, 10 20 years ago the main uh, attack uh, vector was trying to go through your firewall they found that uh, the uh, biggest threat to the internet and computers today is basically the people people not being aware or uh, cognitive of what can happen so emails become the, uh, the uh, bad guys to uh, infiltrate your network use that as a method to actually uh, uh, load into malware to attack your computer and possibly use that as a jumping off uh, infect the rest of your network um, I've seen so many times that uh, the way that they actually got into a network was they sent an email with an attachment the person clicked on that attachment and it loaded a virus on it after that virus is loaded, oh, it's in my volume so low. I'll try and uh, speak up a bit, uh, so I've gotten all the controls down good. Um, the main thing that uh, they can do after they get one uh, computer uh, compromised, they move through the network to find the jewels, you know, the uh, gold in the net network. I've seen before where I had one person they clicked on something, and they um, compromised their account. They use that compromised account to go through the um, network, find a, in this case it was banking, find the um, uh, one server that handled all the, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, money transfers. And they were actually getting ready to transfer over a million dollars to a account somewhere in uh, Hong Kong. But luckily, we were able to stop them. But uh, again, the uh, bad guy is going to use whatever method works the best. And the best to target out there today are the people. Because the people, if they're not um, aware of what can happen out there, they make the whole net Internet um, vulnerable. So, um, if, so if you were to go to a malicious website, um, uh, how does a how can a website infect your computer? Do you still have to click on a link or download something from the website, or does simply opening the URL infect your computer? Sort of what what is the how does that work? What is the risk of going to an insecure website? Uh, with a website, the uh, main thing is uh, what they call a drive by. In other words, you just click on that link, you open up that web page, and it actually wind up. Um, Using one of the scripting link, uh, download malware, add additional uh, password grabbers or anything like that. So again, well, different than email, you just have to open up that web page and actually start um, uh, infecting your computer. Or also, if you click on some link on a web page, it can actually uh, also um, download uh, malware onto your system. So again, there's uh, several different ways. Bad guys are going to make use of whatever method is. Um. Uh. Yeah. yeah. So. So one thing I'm also curious about is it seems to me that some of the types of websites that one might think would be dangerous might actually be among the safest. I'm thinking of like prominent porn websites or prominent gaming websites um, where you think there would be a lot of malicious actors there. But I imagine that those types of websites implement very strong security and are actually maybe among the safer ones. And it's the, the real dangerous ones are probably sort of obscure or sort of customized websites or something that you find on a on a on a 4chan thread or something like that would be more malicious am i off base about that well some of the um porn sites uh, again i'm not in, um, in favor of porn or anything like that but they they are you know put together hacked together by internet so and 
actually targeting uh, individuals to actually gains. So again, um, even commercial sites have been uh, compromised. Uh, uh, when it pop up your news sites, you know you always have those ads that pop up. When the uh, news site didn't bother checking those uh, pop up ads that come up, they allowed the uh, advertiser to actually post the stuff themselves with no checks. Well, they wound up um, providing a path for infecting the customer computers. So whether it's a uh, legitimate site or not so legitimate site out there, uh, you need to be careful. If something looks uh, vicious, uh, sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So again, being aware of uh, what's out there and what can happen is very important. To, uh, everybody. Um, Darkstone, let me direct this to you. Um, what sort of um, uh, you? Uh, what kind of a antivirus um, products are good? Um, uh, you know, do are they really um, effective at keeping up to date with virus threats? Um, and um, are um, are they? Uh, is it really necessary, for example, to set up some kind of private personal VPN to really be safe? Or um, I don't really actually completely understand how um, personal VPNs work to access the main internet. There's got to be some connection there that would still leave you exposed. It seems to me. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um... First of all, as I mentioned in chat, a lot of these sites are actually trying to not infect your system but blackmail you into buying stuff that you don't need by making it sound like you're exposed to viruses and then trying to sell you a fake antivirus, which then downloads a lot of stuff to your computer and actually may uh, cause you to buy stuff that you don't want. But uh, the, the three best antiviruses that I have found so far is Norton's um, and uh, McAfee and uh, Microsoft uh, Security Essentials and I've, I've used all three I prefer an anti antivirus that doesn't take over the whole system and bog things down but then I'm pretty savvy so I can control most of my own um, activities I I do believe that Norton's and McAfee um, do more for somebody than they need. They tend to uh, take over the system, but some people would probably be happier with that and feel more secure. They do come with a firewall. They come with a few extra security issues or systems that you can use, um, and they're they're pretty good. Um, stay away from Kapersky. Unfortunately, they they used to be a really good company, but uh, it was discovered a few years back that they were actually uh, an agent for the Russian KGB, and so none of the government agencies are allowed to use them anymore. And uh, another one that I tend to avoid now is Avast. It used to be really good, lightweight, and effective, but they've gotten... I don't know if somebody took them over or what, but they've gotten really greedy, and I actually suspect in some cases they may have downloaded malware to your computer, but that's my personal opinion. Um, the next stage is, uh, you know, having a good firewall. A firewall pretty much just blocks certain traffic from going into your computer and certain traffic from going out of your computer. Uh, it takes a little more effort to set it up properly, you know, you can find some good YouTube videos on what to do, but it takes a lot of thought, too. You really need to think about what you're running, what you need to run, and, uh, you know, what kind of resources you need to access. Um, and finally, the, the whole idea of VPNs. VPNs were a great idea a few years back, but um, the the hacking community, I guess you could say, has found so many ways to circumvent them that nowadays most VPNs are actually considered to be a liability and people tend to, you know, avoid them. 
which is a, a real problem for telecommuters because uh, one of the big things that we need to do uh, worldwide is expand our ability to telecommute into work, but that's a whole other topic. Um, huh. Virtual worlds may really help with that. Yeah, I um, agree with that. I think virtual worlds are underutilized for that for sure. Um, and very disappointed to hear about Avast. I always thought it was good. Um, I'm a little surprised that Microsoft and um, E are considered good now. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to remember that, uh, you know, Microsoft products, because of their ubiquity, um, were just horribly prone to viruses. So I guess it's kind of good to hear that they've really cracked down on that and beefed up their security so that it really is reliable. Um, that's pretty impressive when you think about it. Um, you know, Apple products were always considered to be pretty safe, I think, because they were less ubiquitous. Um, and um, so they were not as an interesting a tar as a target. Um, is Apple still considered uh, relatively safe compared to um, uh, 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 machines that run Microsoft products? Um, in my humble opinion, there is no operating system or product line out there that is any less vulnerable to any other ones. But um, as you pointed out, some product lines, some companies have a bigger target painted on them. For example, Microsoft. Simply because more people use them, more financial institutions use them. So the, uh, the gold at the end of the rainbow um, is at least perceived to be bigger. So there's more probability that they will be hacked. Hmm. Okay. So... Um... Let's see. Let's see if we have any uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Lovely Cass asks about Linux. Um, how does Linux uh, stack up in terms of? Did one of the other panelists want to answer that one? Um. Uh, Definitely not an expert on the thing, but I was just looking online. Uh, one of them basically says you don't, and the other ones say, well, um, maybe you do. So I'm not quite sure. I'm looking for a little more information myself right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll take that on. Good. Um, again, just like Apple, uh, uh, the Windows is the biggest target out there because you got the biggest user base. But now you look at the different flavors of uh, – Unix or Linux out, getting more and more users becoming more of a, there are malware, and there's no one operating system out there. But so, it does yeah. mean using uh, uh, Apple or uh, Linux can be uh, safer. Okay. Um, now, one thing I'm kind of curious about, like, I've always been a little bit suspicious about, like, buying an antivirus product um, because, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> how do you know? I mean, sure, you, you launch the antivirus and, and you a screen pops up and it, you know, it has all of these sort of progress bars that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, start running. So it looks like something's happening on your computer, but how do you know that that's just not, you know, just some kind of animated screen and nothing is happening? Um, it, um, uh, are there, I guess, maybe is there a resource you can go to that uh, uh, that sort of verifies that antivirus programs are, you know, what they say they're doing? Yeah, there are actually a couple. Um... The SANS Institute does a good job of uh, evaluating the different antivirus programs and anti-malware programs, as well as giving you alerts as what security issues are out there right now. And the National Institute of Security, uh, I forget what the T stands for, it's the NIST, also does that. 
Um, okay, cool. Maybe um, uh, uh, offline you can uh, provide us with um, some links to those sites um, that we can put on the Science Circle website or something. Okay, that's a good idea. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, yeah, Linus Torvalds. Um, under of open computing. Um, let's see. Comments. Uh, let's see. And okay, and uh, Vic linked to a um, tech advisor article. Uh, Linux does uh, Linux need antivirus? So um, uh, maybe we can also include that on our um, Science Circle website. These are great resources here being posted in chat. Um, right. Uh, so maybe, um, why don't we uh, maybe shift our focus a little bit here to um, social media, um, troll farms, um, disinformation. Um, it does seem to me that in addition to sort of the sort of technical security that we've been talking about really now, um, it does seem that the internet is providing um, uh, is uh, just creating a lot of chaos around the world um, in the way um, uh, uh, it's really confusing people about how they can know what is really true or what's really going on. Um, um, you know, uh, Facebook has gotten a lot of um, criticism, for example, for facilitating disinformation that led to a genocide, I think, in uh, or was it Burundi or uh, Myanmar? Um, so I'd be very curious to um, uh, just kind of open it up a little bit to talk about some of the some of the social threats about the internet. You, um, maybe Vic, why don't you um, uh, sort of uh, address that a little bit, if you don't mind? Well, the big one, of course, in the news is ransomware. And I'd like to learn a little bit more about that too, because uh, one of the, I've been following the chat and one of the people we're talking about, uh, I think it was Chantal about being threatened um, over online. And uh, she maybe not, didn't mention ransomware, but just essentially, or maybe did, but the idea was, uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that, about ransomware, about what you can do and what you should do. Anybody be able to speak on that? Um, I would be horrified to have to pay a ransom in Bitcoin, let me tell you that much. Yeah, um, essentially what ransomware does, and you've probably encountered this already, is it, it loads a, a malware on your system that encrypts your drive or drives and uh, then pops up with a message saying you have to pay this so much money to get your data back and we'll send you the uh, key to unencrypt your drives and then uh, they tell you how to pay them. Uh, a lot of companies and a lot of people have actually gone through and paid them because unfortunately they weren't doing remote backups or any other types of uh, ways of protecting their systems. Nowadays the uh, antivirus programs and several firewalls actually are able to detect the ransomware and stop it before it can do anything. Um, some of the drives are already encrypted and they've um, been updated to prevent somebody from re-encrypting them, but it's kind of a, um, how do you put this, it's, uh, it's kind of a race where the good guys keep getting ahead of the bad guys, but then the bad guys outrun the good guys, and, you know, it's ongoing. There hasn't been a uh, a real good solution to stopping them. The best thing you can do is have a remote backup. You know, take the, the, the data that you're most concerned about 
and put it uh, geographically somewhere else on a different computer that you can recover it should your system be damaged. Um, I actually learned this firsthand because my house burned down and all my servers with it, and uh, I did not do a recent backup to the cloud, so I lost a lot of data. Ouch. Yeah. Um, can, uh, can a backup be stored in a USB or some sort of a detached device? Sure, but uh, I would recommend that the backup be uh, kept away from the uh, the house and make sure oh. that it make sure it isn't actually in, plugged into the computer uh, right. when you you know get ransomware actually I would probably make a couple copies have now, one locally so you can get it and then have another one off site somewhere if your computer is encrypted by a ransomware program uh, do you just have to trash the computer? I mean, you can't reload your backup onto that same computer, can you? Uh, you could format the drive, possibly. Um, you may have to do a low-level format, which actually rebuilds the entire uh, firmware or, or the drive itself. That's hard to do. It might be easier just to put new drives in, reinstall an operating system, and then um, reinstall everything you have. The machine itself shouldn't be damaged hopefully it seems to me that preventing um um a, a viral uh, encrypting of your hardware would be easy for microsoft to defend against though i mean couldn't you just um uh, include in the basic windows software um a, a a prevention of encryption without some sort of password protected authorization or something, and that would just block all ransomware? That seems like a good idea, and they may actually be working on that, but um, I don't know if that's happening. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, you can do, uh, I recommend to all my students in that, is you create two accounts. Uh, when you initially get your machine, you create that account, that's an administrator account, which allows you to do any recommend that you out, Ed. That Sam, you're breaking up a bit. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Is that better? Keep talking. Better oh, okay. Uh, what you can do is by using a um, simple user account, you don't longer have the admin privileges, which makes it uh, harder to install some of this uh, malware. Again, you can use all your applications in that. It's just you cannot install new applications as a user. So when you need to go ahead and install applications, you go ahead and log in as admin. Again, it reduces the amount of uh, chance of uh, uh, getting infected by either ransomware or any other virus. Uh, again, there's no one way of um, well, there's no silver bullet out. There's always going to be some way that the bad guys can. Just being aware and cautious. It seems that um, a lot of this um, sort of uh, malicious um, internet activity is being generated by you know, hostile governments. <laughs> um, I think, you know, North Korea and Russia, for example, are really, um, ha and have been for decades, been, you know, really developing um, uh, very powerful malicious tools um, and, um, and also being able to exploit uh, the, all of the personal information that social media companies are are gathering and that combination of just vast vast amounts of personal user data combined with malicious intent and um, and a dedication of resources to this problem um, you know it just feels like some of these uh, kleptocratic regimes have really weaponized the internet um, and that seems like a a, a really uh, scary and new 
kind of threat. I mean, it's almost like we are um, at the beginning of a sort of cyber warfare that used to be the province of science fiction. Um, I I'd love to hear you all's um, sort of uh, what, what you all think is kind of going on. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 Dark Eagle, would you like to maybe, um, do you have any thoughts about kind of what, you know, what is kind of, um, what is the engine for all of these sort of new, uh, this new sort of weaponization of the internet that we're seeing? Well, it's, it's kind of gone through stages. Originally it was, uh, more of a, a status thing. I hacked into this and I did that. And then it's uh, kind of evolved to more uh, financially motivated people trying to get money, social security cards, credit cards, things like that. But you're right, it has become more weaponized where um, different agencies, I won't say different governments necessarily, have been trying to do things like um, attack the power grids and um, their motivations are often like you said political um, there may be other organizations out there besides different governments who are also involved in these kinds of attacks um, and they are becoming more and more prevalent what we can do to protect ourselves is really kind of uh, back to the race analogy where we walk down and try to, you know, protect what we have, find different ways to do that. While at the same time, the bad guys are, you know, investigating and finding new vulnerabilities. The whole problem with security in general is the fact that the good guy has to watch everything, every port on their router, every packet that comes into their system, and try to protect against everything. The bad guy only has to find one vulnerability and focus on that and find a way to get in through there. So we're at a disadvantage to begin with. Right, um, right. Yeah. Um, I, it looks like Vic is typing. Vic, would you like to uh, maybe uh, comment in voice? Um, did I have my typing? <laughs> well, uh, your cursor may have just been stuck in the chat window for all I know. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> in any case, <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately, see, we we're talking about these sorts of things, but unfortunately, the best learning tool is when somebody really does lose their data, get hacked into, um, that kind of stuff. And then it's all of a sudden like, yeah, this is real, okay? Um, but the, there's a lot easier ways to learn than School of Hard Knocks, and so I'm hoping that some of the things we've talked about today will be taken seriously because even experts get have problems. Yeah. And it's not hard to do some of these rudimentary things. Yeah, so we have if a... You look at, uh, if you go, look at no, the go ahead, world... Man. Okay, thank you. Um, you have different types of hackers. You got your nation states that are out there for the political or advantage or to take um, copyrighted information. A uh, good example, uh, if you look at North Korea and uh, Sony, yes. uh, they're upset with the uh, movie uh, interview. Which actually is a very funny movie, by the way. I recommend it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just because of that, I had to go watch it. But... Um, uh, again, it costs Sony tremendous amounts of money. Then you look at the Chinese who act best. Oh, tremendous amount of records on security clearance. Then you go to the terrorist organization. They have their uh, they want to put out there. Then you get on down to the um, other hackers like uh, out there to make money. Then, of course, you got your uh, um, what we call script kitties, you know, they're just going to download some simple uh, program like Canon just to, you know, cause trouble. So, internet, like I said before, Wild West out there, and you're going to have all kinds of different out to um, leave their agenda, whatever it be. 
Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned terrorism. You know, I remember um, a year or two ago after ISIS had been pushed out of Iraq into Syria um, and they were really on the run. And I remember that they issued some statements to the effect that, uh, you know, um, they sort of um, walked back their um, idea, their, their agenda of becoming a new caliphate. And now they were calling themselves the cyber. Um, and that they were basically relocating their revolution to the internet. Um, oh, yeah. 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 And again, that, that's a powerful tool they use for recruitment and, and um, uh, you know, brainwashing and so forth. Oh, yeah. The uh, internet has been their main way of. Uh, recruiting people, especially here in the United States. They've been using that uh, extensively, and they've been very effective at uh, turning people uh, that way. So, again, you, the Internet can be used a lot of different ways for influencing theft, for espionage, you name it. There's a way of uh, using the Internet in their uh, goals. Yeah, um, uh, I'm sorry to uh, step on you there. I just wanted to, I think a tagline uh, mentions um, Mr. Robot uh, with Rami Malek, of course, who plays uh, 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 Freddie Mercury in the Queen movie. Um, but um, but Mr. Robot, uh, maybe we should touch on that a little bit, um, you know, because sort of the premise, at least of the first season, which, you know, where um, he... Um, uh, launches a virus that um, clears everyone's credit, so no one has any more like credit card debt. I hope I'm getting this right, which I think would be a fantastic idea, frankly. <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, this is so. This is kind of an interesting premise of um, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, use of this kind of technology to foment sort of a social and financial solution. Um, uh, maybe it might be fun to kind of speculate about what types of um, uh, sort of large-scale attacks might be feasible with these tools. Um, uh, uh, Sam or Dark Eagle, do you guys have any thoughts about that maybe? Or even uh, Vic, uh, have you ever, have you kind of uh, considered what what might be on the horizon there that would be feasible? Uh, um, actually, I was <laughs> actually I was engaged with uh, Syzygy there in a little <laughs> talk about. Um, well, well, we share, were talking. <laughs> yeah, well, what we were talking about is that it doesn't is one of the things that we have not talked about in voice here, and that's the idea of people intentionally uh, try disinformation. Uh, we're we're thinking about that, but the idea of people just kind of like like I think of it as a fly, and you just tweak the fly, and it buzzes all over the place. And uh, the idea is that people intentionally trying to tweak different sides or extremes of an issue, and you can easily get people tied up in arguments and thinking uh, uh, one way or another because we're it's such a contentious world today, and. Um, that's just as leads to just as many problems as some of the other stuff because you can convince people of anything because they want to believe it, and so I, I think that's an important thing we need to talk about. Um, one of the tr yeah, one of the tricky theory. things with disinformation is that it's weaponized by both sides. That is, disinformation is real, um, especially as mastered by the Soviet by the Russians. Um, who have been mastering this for decades to kind of um, keep their client states in a state of sort of information confusion. They've been doing that for decades. On the other hand, knowledge of the fact that disinformation exists and is effective is being weaponized by the Trump administration to claim that any critical news is fake news and is disinformation. So, and it cuts both ways, and it's just super exasperating. Um, to sort of be able to be able, on the one hand, to be worried about disinformation and be super frustrated when people when people 
basically um, uh, cry disinformation um, for things that they don't like. Yeah, I'd like to make two points on this. First one is that these are all various forms of social engineering, and social engineering is really the the root of almost all malware and disinformation too. Um, and back during World War II, there was, uh, I believe it was one of the generals for the army that pretty much stated that whatever, um, whoever defines the truth for the nation controls the nation. And uh, that's what I think we're kind of seeing here in the United States and worldwide is that people are actively trying to control uh, what the public is allowed to believe. And speaking Aye. of that, um, if you look back again to World War II, um, they've always been using thing, uh, what they call PSYOP or psychological operations. The internet is just a new um, path for people to do the same thing, either through disinformation. There's everything from elections on. Um, Sam, talk closer to your microphone, I think. Oh, okay. Again, you know, Psy um, PSYOP is a big thing out there, and it's been for decades. Just the Internet is just a new uh, tool for uh, performing it. Yeah, perhaps we should uh, carry this on in, a, in an upcoming event because we are kind of running past our time. But uh, yes. it's thank fascinating. You, yeah, thank you, Dr. Eagle. I was just realizing that we're a little past uh, the hour here, and we are uh, straying a little bit out of our um, agenda. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, maybe we can um, uh, reconstitute this panel in a few months and maybe revisit some of these sort of um, as somebody was saying what the origin of propaganda actually was originally came in 1622 or whatever part of the it was a committee in the church called propaganda oh really <laughs> fascinating yeah yeah great content here from uh, my chat well um uh, okay, uh, I think I'm going to seize this opportunity to uh, exercise my executive authority as moderator and uh, gavel our session here today to a close. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, uh, uh, let's hear. It. Let's have some applause for our uh, panel members and um, thanks to all the uh, audience and students here who contributed in nearby chat and. Um, Maybe we can um, uh, revisit these topics again in the near future. I hope. With that, I bring this to a close. Goodbye, everyone, and I look forward to next time. Okay, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Have a good day. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you. Take care, and uh, hopefully, you will pass this along to others. Uh, absolutely, um, and uh, feel free to uh, linger and uh, chat with our audience members and so forth. Uh, and um, uh, again, thanks to everyone, thanks to our panel members who are participating and for our students. For